Okay, so let me get started. Um, and I'll start out by, by welcoming everybody um, and especially our speakers. Um, I just want to provide a little bit of an overview of, of um, the, the speakers and what they'll be talking about and then I'll hand over uh, to the speakers. Um, before I forget, this, this um, session is being recorded so that we can make the recording available uh, at a later point for those who are interested and for those who weren't able to attend. Um, good, so um, I welcome you all. Um, our first speaker will be St uh, Austin Stewart, who is a digital strategist with Accenture Development Partnerships. Um, Austin supports a global portfolio of uh, international NGO clients in the formation and definition of data value strategies across platforms uh, such as cloud, big data, uh, etc., uh, along with analytics and visualization techniques, and uh, uh, helps with the formation of data science capabilities. We will also have with us Hans van Hoof, who is a digital and innovation manager at Accenture. Welcome to both of you and thank you. Um, Austin will launch into this uh, session. He'll talk about a little bit about how data has changed the agricultural sector, particularly in terms of key trends, what they are, um, and related to them, the data capabilities that are critical for an agricultural organization to be successful in this uh, new digital landscape. Um, Austin will also touch upon what a data-driven business model and roadmap for digital transformation looks like. Um, and throughout his talk, he will use use cases to illustrate key points. Um, the next speaker is Paul Roos, who is an entrepreneur, investor, and um, an active supporter of early stage businesses. Uh, he has a very wide background um, and has co-funded a, a seed venture capital fund and, and accelerator focusing on early stage digital businesses. He currently works with Yara International and spearheads their efforts to develop uh, the Open Data Exchange or ODX. In this session, Paul will talk about, uh, or he'll present a private sector view of what it means for agricultural data to be actionable, how multiple data sets could be pulled together in data products that meet key needs. Um, and uh, he'll talk about the, the, the need for wide use of data uh, with a sort of an emphasis on the role that monetization uh, plays in this. So welcome to you, Paul, and thank you for being here. And so without much ado, I'm going to um, hand over to you, Austin. Uh, feel free to share your screen and take us away. Thank you. Meda, Austin seems to have uh, issues with his microphone. So we are trying to, um, um, to resolve that. He has to dial in again. So be patient with us. If there's too much of a delay, Meta, uh, happy to um, happy to jump in first and 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 run through my presentation. Either way, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, apologies. We did we did check um, half an hour ago with with Zoom, and of course, all of the problems were when you're live. But um, go ahead, Paul. Please please go ahead and lead us uh, into this. Thank you. Okay, no pressure. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, okay, hopefully this works. We can see your screen, so that's good. That's a good start. That is a good start. Okay. <laughs> Hi all. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always slightly odd having no feedback when you're doing this sort of thing. And uh, and I, I always much prefer to have it sort of two-way uh, engaged in sort of Q and A as I go along. Um, but uh, but but as uh, as Meta said, I have I have quite a quite a varied background, predominantly in innovation and uh, and agriculture, having been involved in the launch uh, of around thirty to fifty startups and spin outs coming out of universities. I've launched two venture capital funds and and more and and also involved in our family farm. Which has been the family for for generations, but also more recently on the Yara uh, uh, Open Data Exchange uh, initiative, uh, which was uh, which was launched at Davos earlier this year, where Yara and IBM decided to launch a um, a, a a new initiative supporting uh, away from the core business, supporting 
reduction in, in data silos to foster more innovation sustainability. And I get, what I'm going to do today is uh, is cover or try in a very in a relatively short amount of time cover a number of things. Um, one is just just quickly uh, go over the basics of ODX to see where we come at it from from a Yara perspective. <clears throat> Define data and data monetization. Um, very quickly talk about uh, data management and privacy, and and really by the end of this by the end of this uh, presentation, it's it's I'm, I'm looking to answer a few questions, um, and and they're they're listed there. How uh, how we monetize data? Who monetizes it? What is the responsibility that we all have in the protection of that data? And ultimately, what does the farmer uh, uh, and more widely the supply chain get out of the uh, off the back of this this um, data collection and monetization. So very quickly, um, I'm gonna race through. So I, I'm also conscious there's a lot of, there's a lot of details in, uh, in, in this presentation um, and I'm happy to share it after this, uh, after this presentation so you can look into it in, in more depth, but I'll just give you sort of a bird's eye view of as much of it as I can. So very quickly, an executive summary on, on ODX. It's more, it, it's a, it was set up to, um, to look at a new approach and transition towards uh, more sustainable and innovative farming. And, and really it was there designed to, or it, it was being designed to effectively look at, a, look at an individual field and realize that there are a number of layers of data that go into, into making that field or the data that, is, that can be attributed to that field valuable. Uh, and we're going to go into more around what what we what we associate the value of data with and how we how we create value in that. And and really, if we look at if we look at agri agriculture is is obviously one of the if not the oldest uh, 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 industry. Um, it's also one of the last to be digitized, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Austin's probably going into more details in his presentation, but. But it comes down to the fact that there are there are a lot of there are a lot of data silos and there are a lot of data providers um, when it comes to actually generating some sort of valuable use case you have to you have to collect lots of data samples you have to overlay it in a way that actually makes sense to somebody um, and here's here's just a selection of of some of them what ODX is trying to do is is trying to take what happens inside and outside of the um, uh, in, inside and outside of the farm gate aggregate it collect it and, and effectively standardize it to create that uh, to create that value um, and there's a little bit more on the process map that we use within ODX to identify customer ODX tech partner data provider and, and farmer and you can see down the bottom we, we we assess each of these partners within within this sort of roadmap of commercialization in terms of how we how we look at each and how we commercialize or how we build, develop a commercial plan for, for each of these players. Now, simplified cases for, for ODX, uh, and hopefully this will make sense as to why I'm bringing up ODX first, is, is we have to identify what case studies um, we would try and use this, this idea of aggregated data sets for. Um, I, I guess one of the main one that keeps coming up is around sustainability and, and potentially a biodiversity or a carbon credit, uh, which is which is then goes back to you know you're aggregating data, you're generating some sort of value, and then you're being able to pass the value back to the um, to those that generate the the data in the first place. That is that is the that is the concept of this. But let's let's just I do have some I do have some notes that I wanted to refer to. Uh, unfortunately, it's not displayed on on this screen, so I'm going to have to refer to it on on another screen. Um, but let's let's talk about data. Let's just let's because we all talk about, especially in in agriculture, it's the new big thing. You know, data is data is is going to be the uh, the savior to all of our all of our woes and challenges. And and I think the the thing that we need to be clear on is that it, it's being collected in vast vast amounts of data is being collected. Um, Generally, I mean, as, as consumers, we're, we're giving away our data, our private data. But from an agricultural perspective, we're also giving it away. On, I know on our farm, um, we the sensors from the from the tractors are, are collecting data. We are we're responding to surveys. We're passing data through to the government. So we're we're constantly giving up data. And the research institutions that we that, that we work with are also collecting 
and generating data. But, but data is raw uh, and, and processing data, um, processing data is actually the way that, we, that we're able to create the value. But, but in order to create the value of the back of data, we need to develop insights. Um, uh, sorry, insights with purpose. And, and I think that's, that's a key component that I think um, we should take away from today that data really has no value unless there's a purpose to it. And on the right, we see, we see that uh, you know, there's a, uh, a systematic approach to, to the value and the, and the value creation of data. Um, it's not only the generation refining, but it's all the way through to understanding how you how you would utilize that data in the context of, of value creation and so. On. And I and and I, I I added a picture on big oil, and that is to make a comparison that you know we we could we could create oil, we could fill up tankers, we could have them sitting off the coast, but if we're actually not using it for anything, you know, is there any value in in having that oil in the first place? And and, and if we say that data is the new oil, then we should look at it the same way. You know, we, we, sh we, need, to have a, we need to have a use case. And I, and I guess in the context of this presentation, research isn't always, isn't always generating data with a purpose to begin with. And I think this is why it's very important to ensure that we have the right ecosystem where we're connecting innovators to research, those that are creating the data, that are that are create, creating the actually curating the data and those that are finding a specific use case out in the real world. Um, I'm going to give a I'm going to give you a, a, a very quick example of the Yara Mega Lab, which is our which is our Pocklington um, uh, soil analysis center. And and you know it's 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 been around for for many years. It's uh, it's it's probably doing somewhere between two to three point five million soil analysis a year. Um, or oh, two, two and a half thousand per day. I guess the question is, is, you know, we're sitting on, within Yara Mega Lab, sitting on 70 million data points. One could argue that that amount of data has value in itself. If you drill down into those data sets, only 30% of them are geo-referenced. So there's only location data that is, uh, uh, that's attributed to those, those, those 70 million data points, which, then wipes out a lot of value, um, perceived value anyway. And if you look at the 30% that are left that actually have some sort of postcode or, or reference data, um, location data associated with them, then we can quickly realize that actually that location data is usually a postcode where the farm office is, not of the, uh, uh, not of the actual um, field itself. And, and I think this is where, this is where headline 70 million data points sounds very exciting, but drilling down to it, what is the actual purpose of, of having that much data if it's actually not attributed to a specific field? Um, and that's very difficult to, to define unless you're looking at sort of very, very high level strategic uh, um, um, use cases. So I guess this, this is where there's a, there's a lot of data in here. And, I, and I, what I wanted to do is, is pull together some examples of not only agricultural um, companies, but also uh, those in the health space. And I think that that's, that's interesting because there's a lot of data, a lot of open data um, on, in both sectors, specifically in health. And there's about 16 companies that I looked at and they, each of them have different ways of monetizing their data and each have different ways of, of, of actually collecting that data. Um, the point is, is that some of them are startups and some of them are, are either billion dollar companies in their own right or have been acquired by billion dollar companies. So there's a whole, whole, um, whole um, uh, breadth of, uh, of different examples here. And, and I'm not going to go into all the details uh, of each of these, but I will go into, into one specifically. So as you can see, you know, there's a majority of them either use the subscription model or a consulting model um, at various price points. And those price points uh, are really dependent on, on the actual use case of that aggregation data. And all of these companies are aggregating data, whether it be open or proprietary. Um, and are actually then going out to market with a with a, with these different business models. Um, if I look at uh, these specifically, you've got three examples here. Muddy Boots is a is a farm management system again aggregating data, which includes weather forecast and water management. 
It provides a subscription model um, to farmers, but it is a farm management tool. That was acquired by TELUS, a Canadian telecoms business for, um, I think it was an undisclosed amount, but TELUS is around $31 billion company. LexisNexis uh, acquired by, uh, by Relix uh, for, I think it was 700 or 800, 800 million. Uh, and, and Relix, uh, as some of you may know, own ProAgrica and ProAgrica is obviously a, very, a competitor to Muddy Boots, also collecting farm data directly through a farm management system. And benevolent, benevolent AI is interesting because it actually it actually collates collects it collates different uh, uh, open source data in in healthcare, and that's a a UK unicorn worth over a billion. But that is taking they're taking uh, multiple data sets and curating it um, for different use cases. And and they started off they well they started off as a subscription model, then moved very quickly to a consulting model. And uh, and we can go into into that in a bit more detail in a second. I won't go into any of the details here, although I will, um, you're gonna use Grow Intelligence as an example. Uh, but as I said, I will share this uh, presentation um, afterwards so you can actually go into the detail, details yourself and happy to answer any questions later. Um, so yeah, I I'm, I'm appreciate that I'm probably running out of time now, but, but these, are the, these are the main problems that you that you would find when, when you're dealing with uh, the aggregation of data. So whether it be a startup or a larger company, each, each of these businesses in the private sector have the same challenge. Data security, um, cut, customer acceptance towards the business model that you're actually using, the cost of not only buying or aggregating that data, but of hosting the data itself, um, and then regulations and standardization of data, which I know Austin's gonna cover uh, in, in his presentation. So let's, let's go, Let's delve into a specific use case. Um, so I'm just seeing if I've got any notes. So Grow Intelligence is a, uh, well, it's, it's sort of a startup. It's about six years old now. Revenue of only about 26 million. But what's interesting about this is that it's a, um, it, was, it was set up by, by uh, People with financial experience, they they had they understood the financial markets. They understood how you capture data and then you how you use that data um, to create a market or or buy products. Uh, and effectively, you can you can you can associate it to sort of how equity or credit derivative sales would work, or or even how hedge funds work. And and I think this is this this massive. Um, uh, comparison between how a company like Grow, Grow Intelligence uh, or others that aggregate this data out in the market can generate insights are very similar in many respects to, to how the hedge funds private equity companies would work, want to work. But I guess what's, what's interesting is that, you know, they have very big brand name customers, but the data they have used to generate this value is all open source. So what they've actually managed to do is, is actually aggregate uh, lots and lots of data sources. Um, and and here's, here's some examples of it. They, there's 650 trillion data points. Um, I'm sure not all of them, they're actually using themselves uh, all at once. But the, only, the only data that they've actually purchased is, is that of IC, which is the Inter Intercontinental Exchange, which is a financial uh, data source. But they've effectively pulled all that data together and they packaged it and sold it to these big name customers. And they've done it through, let me just quickly skip to this section. No, this one here. So, I mean, I guess, I guess the, main, the main takeaway from, from Grow Intelligence is they tried using one business model. They were a lean startup. They tried using one business model, which is the freemium model, where you effectively take a, uh, a, uh, a product or a platform and you, you, you offer it as a free service. And then as, as you're looking for, for premium uh, characteristics that you wanna opt into, then you start paying. And they, they found that that actually didn't work because it, quite, it was quite a complex product. And they found that they had to move very quickly to a consulting model and then that led to an enterprise model. But where they really did quite well is, is in the top point where they were able to predict 
the um, USDA forecasts ahead of time, which then got the, the interest of the large name companies such as PepsiCo and especially the financial sector, where they are always looking for uh, ways that they can monetize data to re or monetize data, or not monetize data, but they're effectively looking at ways that they can reduce their risk. So for them, when we're talking about, you know, you're, you're, you're creating value, the value of aggregation of data is only there if a customer like a financial institution or the Pepsi or PepsiCo can have it packaged in a way that makes sense to them. And, and for, for these guys, it was all about de-risking, de-risking their supply chain and de-risking how they would probably position trading uh, trades that, that they're likely to have out in the future. And USDA forecast was 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 really their main success in this. Data, data management and, and privacy. This is a it's a it's a very difficult um, it's a very difficult topic to to really go into detail on because it, it really depends on on what data you're you're looking at. And I think if you haven't read the book um, Who Owns the Future, I think it's there's some there's some really interesting thoughts around around the, the collection and treatment of data and, 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 and how we might look to use data in the future. But I think what, what we need to be aware of is that individuals, uh, whether we as consumers or farmers are giving away our data uh, at, a, at an alarming rate. And we're almost in some cases quite protective of that, of that data. Um, we're quite protective of it when actually we've probably given it away in, 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 a, in, a, in a different shape or different form uh, through census or through our own uh, reporting. And, and I think the, the examples that, that we've seen is that if you look at terms and conditions in most of these uh, data sharing agreements is that you're likely not only giving it to the ones that uh, the, the, the companies that uh, you're directly dealing with, but there's also a clause in there that allows them to share that data with with third parties, and that is that is that is pretty common. I mean, less so with GDPR, but but it, it still it still exists. Users don't tend to see the value of sharing of their private data. Um, uh, corporations and innov innovators do. Now that is, if we go back to the initial points around you know the value of data in itself, there is no value un unless you're actually able to curate it. And you can't curate data unless you've got scale or unless you're able to create a, a commercial and business use case, as you can see what, what Grow Intelligence did. Um, so, so I guess I guess the argue the, the argument to make is that is that, uh, that there'd be no value if there was no sharing. Um, and 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 then it comes back to how can we I guess this goes back to why, why we've created ODX is how can you then take those data sets and how can you create a business business case for it? And how can you give some of that value back to the farmers or back to the food producers or consumers? Very, very quick um, example from, from ODX. This is, a, um, uh, this, is, this is a pilot we're about to finish the first phase on, which is effectively taking 40, uh, 40 or so farmers in Colombia, female coffee farmers, they the the challenge that they've had is that they're they they've had their farms for for a long time there but they they've had very little agronomic advice they've had very little education their cooperative that they belong to doesn't uh, doesn't have an inventory management tool so they're not they're not sure exactly how much how much coffee that they're actually producing they're not sure what the quality so there's there's various challenges that they're going through um what we've managed to do is we've managed to collect between 80 to 160 private data points from, from each of these farmers. And, and that ranges from canopy cover to number of trees to acreage, location, first name, last name, a lot of private data. But again, that data on its own is, is uh, meaningless unless you can curate it in a way that, 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 that creates value to the farmer of the supply chain. And so what we've done is, is, is we've been able to connect that with third parties like Cropster and Fairtrade and Climate Edge and, and traders such as Sukafina um, to, to provide certain services that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And so we can, we can take that private data, we can anonymize it, connect it with individual um, 
uh, roasters, ind independent quality assessors, and also provide an inventory management tools so that by the end of it, these, these, this cooperative and the, and the farmers, they have a way to track how much they produce. They understand what the market value is because, based on quality and quantity. And they're actually able to sell it on the open market and then connect to a blockchain solution to then connect it all the way downstream. Now that is, uh, you, you can argue you know, we're collecting data, but then we're passing it on. And we're passing it on in a way that creates the value to the entire supply chain then allows the end consumer or the retailer to then provide a, um, a, a financial reward uh, back to the community by way of a, a, a sending money to something through something called Thank My Farmer, which is connected through the blockchain, again, anonymized, which will then support a, a local project. But that is, that was a, that was a product that was created based on a need. The, the, the data that's being collected is, is, is there because it's needed to be collected. It's not there just for the sake of it. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Uh, I mean, I can, I can go back and cover some more on, pro, on, on uh, Grow Intelligence, but I, I think when, when I first started, there were a few, few questions that I needed to answer. One is on the data monetization and, and what, what does it imply? And and I guess the takeaway, the takeaway on on what on on how we should view data as an opportunity to monetize is that it should have commercial purpose to begin with. Um, it's not. We don't always look at a commercial purpose initially when we're generating data. I mean, farmers farm, farmers are, uh, are, are using the data that they generate to, to be better farmers. So we as consumers give away our data, but as researchers, um, you, you're, generating, you're generating data through research. That may not always have a commercial purpose. Um, and that could all, that could be to do with a number of reasons. One, because it's 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 not the right timing in the market, uh, and I've seen examples of it. There's there's a very good example uh, of a spin out in Imperial that span out and didn't actually get traction until six or seven years later, until there was a um, until there was a market need for the for the for the data and the research that they they had conducted. But but I think if you're looking to commercialize data, you need to start with commercial purpose first. And that's, that's not always possible. So I think we need to be aware of that. Who produces the data and who monetizes it, how it's monetized. I think this, in an agricultural context, it's, it's as I said, it's the researchers and those in the, in the agri-food supply chain. The monetization is really done by either corporates or innovators who are coming up with a specific use case. And, and, and I, it's, it's a business model that that is very difficult to change. It actually, it, it works quite well. I think what needs to change is, is the development of an ecosystem that connects those who are looking to build business models to those that either have the data or are curating the data. And I think this is this is why we're having conversations like this, is trying to understand how, how can we better work with between private and public sector? How can we better utilize open data? How can we all contribute towards Towards these these purpose driven commercial business models that support everyone, not just not just one entity. What does the farmer get out of the data? Very similar to you know, answer to what the consumer gets out of sharing uh, social social data or private data themselves. Very little most of the time. Um, there's examples of precision agriculture uh, where where farmers probably get benefit in kind, but but when it comes to financial um, reward for individual or private data, or even data generated on, on the farm, it's, it, it's very rare. Uh, and I, I was I was on a, a panel discussion last week where someone mentioned that precision agriculture is now mainstream, where I use the example of Yara's own nitrogen, uh, variable rate nitrogen spreader uh, technology end sensor. It's been around for 20 years. So we're talking about 20 year old technology there are 200,000 farms in the UK and there's only 266 variable rate nitrogen spreaders sold in the UK. So I wouldn't consider precision agriculture to be mainstream yet, but we're working towards it. Uh, should data providers expect compensation? I think it's, it, this is, 
this goes into the argument about innovation. Innovation occurs in an open ecosystem where people are willing to share and collaborate. I, it's, I, I think it's, it's very important for, you know, without, without data sources, without collaboration, there's no innovation. And if everyone is, is in silos um, or, or with high barriers to, to entry due to compensation or expectation of compensation, there's less, less innovation. So it's, it's a trade-off that, that, we, that we have to be aware of if, if that's the route that we go down. And I guess what, finally, as I said earlier, the responsibility of the private sector in, in managing this data uh, with the view to commercialize. It's, the private sector has a, has a huge responsibility, but like, like everyone that's dealing with data, there's, it, it, everyone has to, uh, or should, um, ensure that they are, they're complying with regulation and legal requirements when, when they're actually working with data especially private data. But as I said, TNCs usually are ways to get around that. And I think we need to move to more of a transparent um, data sharing agreements. And we need, to, we need to be upfront around what the commercial purposes are for that data um, in each of these cases. Um, that's, that's it. I know there's, there's a lot more I could cover within the presentation, but as I said, I, I'm very happy to share it. Um, Meta, I don't know how how I've how I've gone for time, or if you want thank me you, to go back. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, this this has been great. I see that there's been one question put into the chat, nope. which I mistakenly said has been answered live. But let's wait um, till the end, perhaps, to take questions. I want to make sure that Austin has time. But in the meantime, um, I would welcome. Uh, I would ask the audience to to please feel free to put your questions into the chat. Um, and at the end of once once both speakers have had a chance uh, to speak, uh, we can we can go through and and take them as as they've come essentially. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. That was really good. Um, and now we'll hand over to Austin, and hopefully um, this will work uh, after our little tech glitch that we had earlier. So Hans, welcome. I understand you're going to be running the slides, and Austin is going to be um, talking through them. Is that right? Okay. Yep, I shared my screen. Hope that everyone can see. Yes, we can. Great. Right. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, and, and thanks everyone for your patience of the, the, of course, inevitable technical difficulty <laughs> uh, that is our daily lives. But very, very honored to to be here joining you today. And and thanks, Paul, for a a really great discussion around uh, data monetization. And hopefully, we'll be able to build on that topic a little bit. Um, in, in our own presentation here that connects uh, what we view as the critical data capabilities um, for a data-driven organization. Um, Hans, maybe we can just uh, go to the next slide and do a, a quick uh, refresher on introductions. Yeah, um, sure. I'll, I'll let you go first. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Hans van Hoof. I'm um, Dutch, but working and living from London in the core team of Accenture Development Partnerships. And some of you have worked with uh, with ADP before. We are a nonprofit part of Accenture, so we operate on a um, non-for-profit basis, serving the international development sector. So typically, the the partners that we work with are um, NGOs, foundations, and international development uh, clients like uh, WWF, but also UNHCR um foundations and also cgir um, we've been um fortunate to work with you more intensively the rest the last two years i'd say working on um digital capability assessment um together with brian king the head of big data platform and meta um but also recently with the internal audit function on um, a cybersecurity review and a data management maturity assessment. Um, and um, um, I'll also work with, with Brian in the next couple of weeks um, together with, with Austin to uh, uh, continue to work on the digital capability model and a small bit on IT governance. Um, I'll leave uh, most of the, the speaking to, to Austin um, I think you've heard enough from me the last time, um, but I'll, I'll chime in uh, where, where, that's, um, where that makes sense. And obviously I'll be available for, for questions. So looking forward to, to the session. Thank you. 
Great. Thank, thanks, Hans. And, and thanks, everyone, for, for joining us and listening in. Um, as, as Meta introduced me, I'm, I'm a digital strategy consultant sitting with Hans on our global team for Accenture Development Partnerships. Um, and that spans, you know, multiple portfolios. But I, I did want to just uh, mention that the agriculture domain holds a special place in my heart. I, I grew up in rural America on a farm and um, spent a lot of time with uh, with our own livestock and, and raising them as a child. And um, you know, this is this is a, a certainly close to home topic for me today. Um, Hans, maybe we'll go to the agenda and just and just buzz through this quickly. Um, so as, as Meta introduced, we, we will talk a little bit about the data trends that um, are happening in the development sector and in the agriculture sector. Um, but the, the meat of the conversation, really, we want to introduce uh, Accenture's perspective on uh, data-driven organization and the capabilities that uh, support a strong uh, data-driven culture. And then what we'll do is highlight a couple of use cases where we see um, organizations that are uh, doing that well. We'll, we'll touch on a couple of, of struggles in the sector and how those um, relate back to the capabilities that we'll introduce. And then we'll also discuss the path um, to digital transformation. So we'd like to start the discussion by level setting on some of these key data trends impacting the agriculture sector um, probably for this audience, this is nothing completely novel, um, given your own recent investments in CGIAR, um, in the big data capabilities, as well as your, your research around digital revolution, crop monitoring technologies, et cetera. Um, but that said, we, we did want to take a similar perspective in defining uh, the role of data in agriculture to be threefold. Um, first, that is that it should support the efficient increase of food production. Uh, for example, through smart planting techniques, adverse weather condition avoidance, um, and crop monitoring for, for yield management. Uh, secondly, it should decrease food loss and waste by helping to support the economic condition prediction of supply and demand, as well as understand um, provenance and life cycle of consumable food. And third, uh, it should increase the visibility and transparency of the food value chain by extending data integration to the first mile food producers. Uh, the ways by which this data is produced and consumed is evolving as well, um, as technologies are becoming generally more accessible around the globe and on in all, in all markets. Um, it, moving down to this sort of second tier here, key trends, um, the term advanced analytics is, uh, is often used as a catch-all phrase um, that describes combinations of new data in new ways. Um, and here we've brought in that definition to include specifically the, the use of artificial intelligence and big data. Um, but what we really mean uh, are advanced analytics driven by uh, these, these other trends two through five. Um, so, so the second trend, information sharing, which we'll highlight uh, a little bit deeper with the use case, um, refers to the use of, of mobile phones and devices for information sharing on the ground. Um, especially in, in low resource uh, context. Um, mobility is often associated with advances in, in global health access and financial inclusion. Uh, however, we are seeing more use cases where simple technologies um, are, are being applied to agriculture in accessible ways. Geospatial data is of course a hot topic for, for agriculture, uh, particularly when evaluating longitudinal weather conditions using satellite imagery for large scale land usage and conditional analysis. Um, we're also seeing the use of geospatial data when it comes to optimizing resource mobilization and utilization. Uh, one example being uh, with the company Hello Tractor in Eastern Africa, um, which uh, makes accessible sort of shared fleet management um, applications and, and um, basically democratizing uh, those assets where they're most needed. Um, as well as we see geospatial data use cases um, with smallholder farmers to determine, for example, um, where to invest in, in pack houses for, for crops um, that will be um, sort of safe and, and uh, avoiding any um, high risk for, uh, for disaster. Um, ADP has engaged with a couple of clients who, who are in sort of the proof of concept steps of applying geospatial data to their own uh, impact models. And, and we'll highlight a couple of those as well. 
Uh, I wanted to include a commercial input here on number four related to remote sensing, um, because I think it's important to understand uh, sort of the long-term perspective here. Um, the, the market for, for remote monitoring technologies, for example, um, automated longitudinal data collection on soil acidity or, or oxygen content is rapidly expanding globally. Um, and what that means or, or will mean for the development sector is a proliferation of, of devices that are reliable, durable, and accessible and cost-effective um, to, to the smallholder farmers or less commercialized operations in the years to come. Um, and that's important as we'll talk about in, in the coming slides on uh, just the digital literacy and capabilities needed, not just by organizations using data, but also by the ground uh, level farmers on their data collection techniques. Uh, the final point here on supply chain visibility is particularly important in, in the development sector. Um, as, as more and more components of the food value chain are digitized, it, it will become easier to identify uh, the points of failure in these supply chains and, in turn, be able to improve the resilience measures and allow for more agile adaptation when there are shocks in the sector. Um, you know, obviously, the case in point being with, with COVID-19, um, how, how resilient are these uh, food distribution channels, especially when, uh, you know, an, an increase in, in demand is, is uh, shocked in, into the market. Um, the greater traceability and supply chain also has tangential effects. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be seeing increased gender equity, um, transparency for farmers to drive fairer wages and, and greater financial inclusion um, and, and explainable food conditions within that supply chain to track potential health risks, um, contaminations, et cetera. Hans, could we go to the, the next slide to introduce our, our framework on capabilities? So while it's easy to talk about the trends in a vacuum, uh, we wanted to introduce this point of view because we, we believe it takes a committed data-driven organization to really make those trends a reality. Um, so at Accenture, we, we tend to orient our perspective on data capabilities into the 12 buckets on the screen. Um, these may look familiar to some of you based on uh, some of the work that Hans is leading with the digital maturity assessment. Um, so I won't dive too deep into them, not conscious of time. But what I would highlight is that um, sort of this top tier data foundation capabilities answer the question, how do I collect data and manage my data? The data management capabilities answer the question, how can I trust my data? Insight and analytics answer the question, what does this data truly mean? And the data usage capabilities answer the question, how can we best utilize our data to better serve our constituents? And I think here is, is where there's a lot of really great um, tie-in to what Paul was introducing around monetization um, or commercialization of data itself. Of course, there are barriers to, to building maturity in these areas, um, and, and we most often recommend starting with uh, the data strategy to understand how organizations envision collecting data, making it useful, and reporting impact back to stakeholders. Um, and then secondly, establishing rigorous data governance processes um, to reinforce internal literacy among your organization um, and that means uh, building common definitions on terms, um, making sure there are standard and non-standard ways of accessing uh, your, your organization's data, et cetera. The, the last thing I mentioned here on the slide is that while there's a logical progression around the circle, um, it's not meant to imply uh, a hard dependency. You know, all of these capabilities are, are critical and require periodic and in some cases constant monitoring. Um, for, for data-driven organizations to be successful. Um, next, we'll, we'll dive into a couple of use cases and talk about where organizations are demonstrating a data-driven culture. And I, I might abbreviate these couple of slides just to leave time for, for questions at the end, but um, some of you may be familiar with, with WeFarm. Um, this is a, a platform, a peer-to-peer -peer, um, information sharing platform in Eastern Africa that has connected over 2 million users um, to, to each other um, in order to ask and answer questions around uh, their, their agriculture management. 
uh, the, the platform is based uh, on, a, on a big data uh, repository that collects and, and use it, collects information uh, inputs from, from people asking questions and then uses machine learning to, um, to best match those, those questions and with respondents who um, would have the, the correct answers. And that can be based on um, specialty of the responders or, or maybe geographic proximity to where the question was being asked. Um, but we wanted to highlight WeFarm as, as leading with a true data-driven business model. Um, the entire service that they provide relies on farmers and experts exchanging in a text-based way data through their cloud platform. Um, of course, they, they need and have built an, an elastic platform that can expand in terms of the amount of data stored um, and in the compute power that it takes uh, to continually refine its machine learning algorithms. Uh, and perhaps one of the most interesting defining capabilities of, of WeFarm is its, in, is its emphasis on artificial intelligence design um, that integrates seamlessly with its human counterparts, meaning its constituents, uh, by incorporating natural language processing libraries with localized language um, applications in, in Eastern Africa. So not only do they provide the service in, in English, um, but their model also translates to, to three additional languages um, in, in Eastern Africa. Let's go to the next slide, Hans. Um, here, I'll, I'll just quickly highlight a couple of uh, use cases where ADP has engaged this year. Um, the first being with, with Mercy Corps, we, we worked on a data visualization um, effort with them to respond to uh, the twofold dynamic <laughs> crisis of, of uh, locust infestation in 2020 plus the impacts from the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so what we were asked to do is work with them to visualize where food security needs would be felt most and what resources might be required to address those needs. Um, the type of dynamic threats in, in part um, that we see not just in this instance, but in, in many others um, are, are more easily or more rapidly addressed when the data capabilities that we discussed before are, are um, strong and, and are present. Um, so with this example with Mercy Corps, um, a clear analytic strategy was set up front um, during which the organization was carrying out user and subject matter research, um, defining the food security indicators and frameworks that they wanted to use functionally, and then describing the, the analysis and, and visualization tools required to deliver on those indicators. Um, and what we ended up doing was using over 20 different data sets um, to, to do this, including geospatial, geospatial data. And, and the importance here um, of data quality cannot be overstated. Um, when you try to combine many different data sets, uh, as I think Paul was um, introducing when we talk about open data sources and, and all of the different collaboratives for data sharing, it can be very difficult to, to manage that beyond uh, beyond um, just the immediate usage for, for a project and, and incorporating that into Looks like we might have lost Austin. Um, All right. I'll, I can't <laughs> continue. continue. I, I think my internet just dropped. Yes, it did. Okay. Go ahead, Austin. All right, you're, you're back. back. All right. So We're sorry. <laughs> I, I would, did, I, would ask, drop? I would ask though that you wrap it up in about a, a two minutes so that we can have some time for questions. Great. Thanks. Yeah, Hans, maybe let's go to slide nine. So I'll just quickly introduce this uh, this operating model, and it ties back very closely to the capability wheel that we discussed. Um, but this is one tool that that we use in Accenture to help assess and, and uh, define recommendations on how organizations can, can move along that maturity curve and increase the, their, uh, uh, the maturity and, and those capabilities. Um, I, I won't drain this, but I, I did want to introduce this uh, as, as a starting point for organizations to think about um, how they can sort of uh, compartmentalize each of these topics and, and think about the efforts to um, to improve. And, and Hans, maybe we'll just go to the last roadmap slide so we can leave time for questions. 
Um, yeah, this is a, a great visual that we like to use just to sort of bring it all together. I, I don't think that description is, <laughs> is the right description. There's no knife there. Um, but, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, we, we always recommend to start with the data strategy, understand the impact levers that organizations have with their data and the potential for analytics to, to impact the near and long term uh, constituents uh, journey. Uh, the, the governance piece, of course, is, is something that I don't want to um, understate because it, this is something that we see all the time uh, as, as a critical issue and, and a, a big obstacle to overcome. Um, and that includes elements of, of the right types of data stewardship and internal data literacy of your organization um, to really manage that data in, in a sustainable way. And all of this sort of leads to um, your value realization, which can be in a commercialized or monetized way or in, in terms of how you report on, on the impact of, of that data to, to the end users and, and constituents in the development sector. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Um, apologies for, for going maybe a couple minutes long, but I'm happy to, to turn it back to Meta for, for any questions that have come through. Great. Um, thank you very much, Austin and Hans. Um, thank you also, Paul. Um, I am going to launch into questions with the first one that we got uh, through the chat. This is from Scott Kleinberg, and I believe it is for, um, for Paul. So Scott would like to know if there are data applications that have been successful in, in, in small, uh, sort of some of the small, less developed uh, countries. Um, and Scott, if, if you want to qualify that a bit more, feel free to unmute yourself and, and speak up. But if that's clear to you, Paul, if you want to talk to that, that would be really helpful. Um, yeah, look, I think, I, I, okay, so, so I think there's, there's, um, there's something we need to clarify. One is, one is, you know, the product, a product uh, versus versus a platform or a data aggregation or a data exchange versus a product. There's plenty of examples of good products, digital products that are out there that are enabling farmers uh, to farm more effectively, to optimize yield, to provide them financial inclusion. There's plenty of them out there. Um, you know, on the insurance front, I know CGI is well aware that Pooler.io that's got about three million farmers on their platform that's providing insurance. Uh, Yara has a, uh, a weather, very simple weather, weather app um, that is that, that has managed to uh, be downloaded about 1.5 million times in India. We've got a social media app very similar to WeFarm uh, in Thailand. So, so there are these, there are apps that are delivering services um, out in uh, out in, in these communities, most of which are most of which are free. There's one that again developed by by Yara, which is called At Farm, which has has actually uh, got a lot of traction. Has made a lot of impact in in to, to farmers all over, but but actually, it, it's it's not a viable business model. There are, there are very few that have managed to achieve viable business model status. Where you know, you've got the likes of Grow Intelligence, which is you know hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investment. Um, and it's, it's turned over 26 million. So there's, there's a good use case there, but they've, they've had to commercialize via a, uh, via big names. We farm, as Austin said, is, is another good example. You know, it's traction is East Africa. Its team is based in London. Um, and depending on who, you know, my, I, my background is venture capital. And I know, I know when we farm was being, was being, uh, invested in by VCs in, in London and, and you've got one one set of VC saying, well, I know this is supporting East Africa. It's based out of London. What impact is it going to have? It's a social media tool. It's, it's a tool that, that generates communication. Where's the commercialization? And so some VCs were saying, well, I, I can't see, I can't see the route to market. And others were saying, this is, this is, this is the social media for, for, for democratizing farming in and, and, and sharing of data in throughout Africa. So it depends on, on who's looking at it, but there's plenty of examples of, of um, uh, of good products, I think the challenge the challenge and there's one of the other questions is around standardization of data sharing, and this comes back to you know how do we treat data and how do we and how, and, and how do we ensure that we provide a, an ecosystem that allows the sharing of data and it's, I mean it's all it's up to all of us because without the sharing of data, you're not going to generate enough value for these companies to to scale. Um, 
I don't know if that answers the question, but, but, but uh, happy to turn it over to, to anyone else that has. So Hans and, um, and Austin, uh, you, you did mention uh, a couple of those, those kinds of data applications uh, that I believe that Scott is, is referring to. Um, and it, it does tie in, as Paul pointed out, with Gideon's question about you know, his concern that interoperability is sort of at the root of all of this. In order to make data actionable, you need it to be interoperable. Um, and too often, that's something that falls through the slats. It's hard to do. Or, or is seen as hard to do. Um, and, and so what would be your reaction to that given these use cases that you've been dealing with, these types of data applications? Yeah, um, it, it is, it, this is like the, the diamond question, right? Like if we can solve for interoperability, then, then most of these uh, problems, uh, well, are at least alleviated. Um, I, yeah, it, it is really tough to say. I mean, it, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation oftentimes, right? When you think about the consumption needs uh, from a commercialization point of view, I mean, it, it could be um, one way to look at it, but also for, for some organizations who just have um, donor metrics to report back, that's a very different way of looking at that. And, and who leads on defining the, uh, the, the golden standard is, is not easy to to land on, right? Um, I think, you know, from my perspective, I, I think there is a bit of a get your own house in order question at, at play first um, in order to come to the table and, and be able to discuss, uh, you know, here's the data that we have, what data do you have, and, and how can we harmonize this in a way that uh, is usable, as, as Paul is talking about. Um, but without really having a strong sense of, of who all from the ecosystem is coming to the table and, and what they're bringing to it. Um, it. It's kind of hard to just speculate what, what those standards need to be. Um, I, I don't know if that's a direct, a very direct answer, but um, maybe, maybe Paul, you have, you have a, a perspective that you'd like to share as well. I, I, I do have a perspective and I, I think it comes back to back to this, this, everyone talks about data, the commercialization of data is this, this holy grail. Um, when actually it comes down to it, uh, again, with a venture hat on, I, I, my first venture fund, I saw six and a half thousand deals in the first year, and each of them are talking about being the next Facebook or being the next Uber, whatever. So big vision is one thing. So, so how, do we, how do we share data and how do we scale and how do we do all these amazing things over the long term? Because you want to talk about you want to talk about the generation and creation of value, so that you're an investor or proposition. But the ones that are the most successful are the ones that that focus on on solving a localized challenge. And that localized challenge, when you drill down into it, it is not that difficult if you build the right partners and build the right ecosystem to to deliver a a, a very structured solution. Over a, over a period of time with clear KPIs. And, and the interoperability, when you start really drilling down into the stakeholders required to actually build a localized solution is not, is, is not always as bad as one would think. Because I think you, you we, 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 we start off thinking big and we start off thinking about, you know, all these data sets that we need to have all in the melting pot to create value when actually Really simply, if I, I look at the UK and you and I talk about precision ag again, precision ag is proven to reduce inputs, to reduce costs, but but fundamentally requires farmers to have to change their behavior. And when you when you've been running the same farm for eight generations, when you're su when you're backed by subsidies, and you're not being incentivized to be innovative, why change? And and then it and then suddenly you've got Brexit and you've got the 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 deregulation or change in the agricultural bill and suddenly this uncertainty drives innovation and if, and and there's there's countries like uh, like the Middle East and Israel and Africa where uncertainty is a daily occurrence and that drives innovation anyway so you've got the willingness to change look at look at mobile money as an example mobile money is is complicated in developed countries because people are used to cash. They're used to, used to the banking system working for them. In Africa, um, it far surpassed uh, mobile money and peer-to-peer -peer tra um, uh, uh, transactions. It's far surpassed 
you know, the, to what we see uh, in developed markets because of the, um, the need to change. And you would say that actually interoperability, we should be further ahead because of open banking, but we're not. And so I think it's, it's driven by a local need and, and those innovators that are out there to, that are willing to build a, a, a core stakeholder, a mix of stakeholders that, that are willing to share data and build it, building a solution can, can do it without interoperability being a massive challenge. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the headlines today with with Britain rolling out the the Pfizer vaccine, and I was thinking that there's no better example of of an open um, data set uh, that that has that has really fostered innovation and allowed us to to to, to answer a, a critical need um, than than the COVID nineteen. Uh, pushed, you know, what, what, what pushed, what, what COVID-19 pushed us to do essentially, and, and what that's, what that's blossomed essentially. Um, so I wonder, you know, do you see something like that ever happening in agriculture? I mean, we face a lot of, um, a lot of crises. Uh, they, they tend to be localized crises more often than not. Um, and our response is never like this. Our sector lags behind in making data open, in, in making, uh, you know, in making data actionable really um, how, how can we get how can we how can we hasten that process I mean we're already working towards it um, I know this is I'm, I'm dragging on a little bit Paul but this also relates to what you talked about with um, you know open data equals faster innovation uh, and you tied that into the the question of you know data providers uh, and, and data providers making their data open but the flip side of that is when I when you showed that slide on on the, um, the soil data, Industry sits on data that could that could be really um, that could be really useful for research in, in in for researchers to use, but it's very rarely available uh, to, to them. So so it kind of goes both ways. And I think in this talk we focused much more on on private sector sort of using um, public sector data. How do we how do we try to 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 do a COVID nineteen type of um, you know brilliant solution? Uh, making sure that we're actually exchanging data both ways. I'm not putting this very eloquently, but I hope you you understand what I mean. Maybe uh, uh, I, go on, yes, hands, please. Oh yeah, no, I, I just wanted to, to quickly share that there's actually what we see is an increase of such initiatives that you you're just um, describing, Meta, and actually CGIAR um, is working on a, a pro-competitive pre-commercial uh, platform um, that's already much more um, happening in the, the pharma uh, industry where there is basically a central pl platform with tech capabilities and um, a smart way to share and uh, store and share data and the insights uh, that you get from it and the combinations that you can make with the different types of data is then available for, for everyone because there's always a certain stage where you know where things get commercial and, and difficult, but there's always also a certain stage where um, um, you just you just want to see if um, uh, the data that you're using uh, and can um, can be useful in combination with other types of data, and that's exactly the moment where you want to use it, that type of platform. And other combinations that we've seen, for instance, with uh, Rabobank in the Netherlands, where um, they bring together data, or they are creating a platform for all the startups that they're in, the, the ex startups that they're investing in, to bring their data to, and then they sponsor the data capabilities. Um, so we do see an increase in in what you're just describing. I think you know the, the COVID challenge is unparalleled, um, but I, I can imagine that. Um, you know, there are food challenges and actually the whole mission of CGIAR is, is somewhat towards that direction um, that, that can be somewhat comparable. And if we ever, you know, go to a space where there is a, you know, crop disease or whatever that, that limits um, certain commodities, we might, uh, yeah, we might, we might face such a challenge, but let's, let's hope not, but it will, it will foster innovation, of course. <laughs> I, I just add one one comment only because uh, this 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 whole topic is near dear and dear to my heart because with all of all of my free time I'm also doing a PhD uh, with Cranfield and Rothamsted on on agricultural innovation ecosystems for the very point that 
you know, we have to understand what is the right ecosystem to foster greater amounts of innovation between research, private and, and public. And, uh, and, and I think this is where, whether we like it or not, there is consumers driving a, a, an awareness within agriculture. There is this whole extinction rebellion and the, the, the climate change um, uh, uh, drive to, to a more sustainable future is also driving change in agriculture. And, and I've looked back at, you know, what are, the, what are the things that have happened in history that have driven innovation? And they're usually linked to, you know, plagues or wars or entire countries like Qatar, uh, when they were having a, a, a disagreement with their neighbors, they, they, they overnight flew in, flew in many, many, many cows to create one of the world's largest dairies. You know, there's, there's, there, has to, there has to be a need for, uh, for innovation to occur in the sharing. And this is, uh, and this is some of the, some of the, some of the most, the, the most valuable companies uh, now are built on the back of uh, recessions in 2008 after the dot-com bubble. And in agriculture, this, this uh, awakening of, uh, of, of agriculture 4.0 and, and the consumer drive and the climate drive for agriculture to change and to be more accountable is going to drive innovation. So I think, it, I mean, it will come. We're at the early stages of it. You could see the beginnings of it with, uh, with this drive to um, alternative meats. We could see the drive to sort of uh, understanding adding labeling to, uh, um, to for carbon footprints for, for, for produce that are likely to appear on our shelves in the next year or two. Um, so this is, this is happening. It's not just you know, provenance and food security, the new agriculture bill that just got passed in the UK around you know, the providence of, of, of food in the UK. All of these things are going towards the requirement and the need for us to have drive innovation, which is going to open up you know, who holds the data? Who's responsible for the data? How do we use this data to innovate? Just like, we, as you've rightly pointed out, that what we've seen with COVID. Excellent, thank you. I know that we're out of time. We're over time by eight minutes. Um, but if there's any last question from the audience, please feel free to ask. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wait a couple of minutes. Um, if you are not able to raise your hand, I don't know if this you know, this Zoom thing is, it has changed from what I recognize. But if you're not able to raise your hand, just put a quick thing in chat saying, I wanna ask a question or I have a question and I'll, I'll unmute you. But um, while we wait, in the meantime, I, I will, uh, I, I actually do have one question. So maybe I'll, I'll ask it anyway, because I was curious about the, you know, the, the we farm like uh, applications. I mean, it's great that, that, that the success with which um, we farm has met and there are others like that that we're aware of. Um, my question is, what do we know about validation there? Because when, when it comes to social media, I think we, we are all aware of, of the many, many uh, opportunities and, and um, uses of social media to spread disinformation or just to, just to you know, to spread unvalidated, uh, not necessarily intentionally uh, spread misinformation, but unvalidated information that can actually in the end do more harm than good. So wh what, what are our thoughts about this? What are your thoughts about this? And, and with that, we'll, we'll end unless somebody else has another question. Yeah, maybe I can uh, start on this and, and others can hop in. But I, I think that you know this, this question is really a question about the internal governance and audit function of an organization and their willingness and capability to expose uh, and explain their their artificial intelligence or their machine learning processes. Um, with WeFarm, you know, specifically, right, they have a massive big data platform, they have a machine learning algorithm. Uh, it is incumbent on them to also uh, report on that, right, and, and conduct audits on those uh, those outcomes that their platform is, is delivering um, and make sure that's visible to not just their their funders or, or who's making money off of their reports, but also to the constituents themselves that are uh, participating in the platform. Um, I, you know, this is a trend that's, uh, as you mentioned, Matt, I mean, this is a social media trend writ large, and uh, it, it's certainly highly scrutinized. But, you know, I would say that that is a core capability that if they don't have it or if organizations don't have it, they need to consciously develop and build into their culture of this ex explainability question in, in AI. Um, 
yeah, any, any other thoughts from Hans or, or Paul on that? Hans, I feel like I've done a load of talking, so I'm, I'm happy to hand over. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, sorry, I, I, I don't have a, have a lot to add to. I, I echo what, what, what Austin was, was saying. That was my answer was kind of about the same. So go ahead, Paul. I mean, just very, very quickly on that. Uh, you know, validation in a commercial context comes when, when a customer that is driven predominantly by, by profit or in NGOs to financial sustainability pays for the product. Um, that's not always the case when you're talking about an early stage innovation business model where you know, profitability is, is not the key driver, uh, growth is. But I think it's uh, you know, validation of, of the data or validation of the product comes when someone pays for it. Really, quite simple. You know, and, uh, and, our, and our requirement to, uh, to ensure that uh, the appropriate governance um, is, that's a whole other topic, but you know, I think uh, I think val if, if the question is around validation, it comes in terms of who, who pays for it and what are they willing to pay for that. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I don't see any other questions. So I think um, with that, we will conclude uh, with huge thanks to, to you three, to our three speakers um, for making the time, for staying longer. I'm sorry to keep you longer, but it's been absolutely wonderful to have you here. Um, Thank you very much. And thank you to the attendees. Um, sorry to keep you longer, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much, guys. Take Thanks care. All. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.